We'll begin in prayer as we look at Romans chapter 8, 3 verses 15, 16, and 17. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for the miracle of your presence to be with us. Our Holy Father, on this Father's Day, let us be blessed more and more knowing that you are our Father. And that's a miracle in Jesus' name. The heart of a father is to protect and to provide. Human beings have that image of God put in them. Fathers want to protect and provide. Protect means to preserve, to guard, to keep, to provide means to bring what is needed. Think about this protection and provision. God so loved, put your name in there, that he gave his one and only son. That's protection and provision right there. And we have it on a little card here and just something maybe to meditate on all week long. Romans 1, 8, verses 15, 16, and 17. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. He's talking about people who are born again. They're believers. Our whole life has changed. And that's what this is about. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, I'm going to stop just for a minute because some people have a, have a problem with parents. They don't have parents. And remember the, one, the number one uh, law that God put, you can read it in Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you want to survive in the land, it's not the milk and honey. It's can you pass my ways on to your children through parents. When children don't have parents, they're doing the right thing. They're, this is terrible. However, God will heal that by becoming our parent. So right in the middle of a situation, we can just say, Abba, Father. And that's what this is about. You did not receive a, the spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We're not orphans anymore. And if we are his children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. It all starts with adoption. Sonship means adoption. And he starts out essentially by saying what we didn't receive. And why would Paul do this? Because this world is so confused. No, you did not receive the spirit again, again to fear. See, we have a past. Our past life is muddy, isn't it? Aren't we made of dust? We're just, it's a dust up in our lives. And we can, our past can still mess us up. And it's still with us. The past hangs on to us, doesn't it? We had to realize we have a whole new future in God, a whole new revelation. We've been given this, we have not been given the spirit of fear. And the, literally that word is phobia. The word this world loves, it seems to throw around today. We don't have a phobia. Not at all. Phobia is a weakness of the mind. Phobia is a fear that causes us to withdraw and cringe and maybe act a little out of whack because of a phobia. I remember a few years ago, Bernie Sanders was grilling one of President Trump's nominees for a cabinet post, and he knew he was a Christian, the nominee. There are quite a few nominees, praise God. And uh, he finally said, you're an uh, Islamic phobe, or something like that. You're a Islamic phobia. And if Bernie Sanders is a truth phobic, because Islam and Christianity are completely different. If so, so if you disagree, you're not a phobic. You're just telling the truth. So this world is kind of like that. God has not given us a phobia. He's removed it from us and given us the spirit of adoption, sonship. We belong to him. We're not a slave again to fear. We have the God of heaven as our father. Now notice how that word again is used. I don't think that's an accident. It's a little subtle in there. We have not been given the spirit of fear again because it speaks of a pattern that will not stop. It's again and again and again. Kind of reminds you of Charlie Brown. I'm always, always a fan of Snoopy and Charlie Brown. And you know what happens when Charlie Brown goes to fly a kite? He always gets in a trouble and he gets turned upside down. He's hanging from a tree with a kite string. Every time it's a pattern. Cursed is he who hangs from a tree. Poor Charlie Brown. So human nature, we have the fear of not measuring up. And we're going to be like Charlie Brown, just getting tangled up in our own righteousness, constantly thinking we must be right, and we're going to fight for our own righteousness. And then we become phobic about God's standards because it creates a guilt in us. 
that also causes a phobia. That's why this whole world is full of religions. This whole world is covered with religions because everyone knows they need to get somehow back to God somehow. And, they, and it really becomes a slave's existence that never lets up. A slave again, again, again to fear. So I think we should use God's word, not the religions of the world. Here's what God's word says in verse 15. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, of sonship, and no religion is necessary. You already, you're in. You're a child of God. In fact, we have been removed from Adam. You can read 1 Corinthians 15. It's a beautiful chapter. It just constantly goes, compares how we are in Adam and how we are in Christ. It says, in Adam all die. That's the pattern. But in Christ is another pattern. All will be made alive. And we are. But we must, as Jesus said, be born again. We must be born in Christ. In fact, I want to look at John chapter 1. <clears throat> Powerful little I just want to look at a couple of verses that kind of really explains what we have been given. John chapter 1 verse 12. Essentially, John begins to say, well, you know, the world has rejected Jesus. But in John chapter 1 verse 12, he says, however, here's a giant however, yet to all who received him, meaning Jesus, to those who believe in his name, that means authority. So in other words, we have a whole new authority over us. He gives the right, and that word right means authority, power, to become children of God. Then he's going to give three disclaimers. Verse 13, children born not, excuse me, children born of God, not of natural descent, nor of human decision or of a husband's will. Three disclaimers. However, we have been born of God Children of God. So Romans 8.15 is so powerful. We have not been given the spirit that makes us a slave again to fear. But we have been given the spirit of sonship, of adoption. And we can cry out to God, Abba, Father. This world has no idea what Christians have in Christ. This relationship. They only see a religion, and they only see a ritual. They only see fear, a phobia. They only see a Charlie Brown hanging from a kite string again and again. And who knew that we have a whole new new? We have a whole new who? Who? We are God's children. That's who we are. Isn't that amazing? We are God's children. We may not feel like it, but it's not about feeling. It's about truth. The family of God, how powerful that is. And we can cry, Abba, Father. Abba is a term of intimate relationship with a father. We say, Abba. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Abba, Father. We can do the same thing. Adoption. Now, adoption, it's all over the world. People get adopted. Imagine going to an adoption agency and saying, you know, I want God to adopt me, please. They would look at you a little crazy and maybe they would kind of show you out the door. But God will not show us out the door. Jesus is the door and he invites us in. We, I will make sure you're adopted through God. If the door is open, come on in. It's not our idea. We didn't make this up. This is the gospel. We'll become children of God. It's God's plan. A whole new ID. And it's deep in our hearts forever. Then we have a testimony, verse 16 of Romans 8. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We have a testimony. Testimony in a courtroom is a speech of truth, to prove a truth. And courtrooms are full of testimonies to prove what is true. This courtroom is in our heart, isn't it? It's deep in our hearts to show who we belong to. Your Honor, I'd like to call to the stand the Holy Spirit. The wind, the ruah, the wind comes in and testifies with our spirit that's been born again. We belong to God. How, how do we know, the judge would say, how do you know? Well, the Holy Spirit's telling me and the new spirit I have is telling me. Plus, we have God's word. God's word. <clears throat> the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. What a Father's Day we have. Happy Father's Day. 
God is calling everyone out of this world. Just give your life to Jesus. You'll have that testimony in your heart. We all know that, correct? I'm not making this up. That testimony is in our hearts, correct? We know it. Now, in the Roman world, in the ancient Roman world, if you weren't a Roman citizen, you didn't get a lot of rights. But if you got adopted, because they would, they would have the power of adoption in the ancient Roman culture, you would be completely removed from the old family and put in the new family. And it would be registered on file. It's, it's the law. We have been completely removed from Adam. And we have been placed in Christ. And it's done in heaven. No one is going to mess with that file. And then in, in, in the ancient Roman culture, you'd lose all the rights of the old family. You have no rights at all. Whatever they have, you don't have it anymore. You have all the rights of the new family. And we have that in Christ. We are heirs of God and co-heirs together. Co-heirs with Christ. Look what he has inherited. We inherit the same thing. And then we, get a, we lose the old father and we get a new father. No wonder believers can say, Abba, Father, and it's the truth. And then what would also happen in that culture, all the debts were paid. We have all the debts of sin paid for us through Jesus Christ. It is finished, paid in full. And then also they'd have one last thing in that Roman culture. You have to have witnesses. Two or three witnesses have to come and show that this is true. We have the witness of the power of the Holy Spirit, don't we? We have the witness of God's word. God makes us alive through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is the Trinity as our witness. So we have quite a testimony, don't we? And in all of that, and I know as believers, we realize this. We have an inheritance in God. We have an inheritance waiting for us. We have part of it now already in our hearts. But we all know we're going to a different inheritance in the future. Romans 8, 17. Now, if, there's a big if there. If we're God's children, then we're heirs. That means we're inheritors. We don't earn it. It's just a gift. Because we're related now. It's a relationship. We are heirs and then heirs of God and co-heirs together with Christ. And there's a reality, reality, reality to this that you cannot measure. We can say, Abba, Father. We get eternal life. How long does it last? Forever. And the quality can't be measured as well. We're started the quality already, haven't we? We understand. And if you can remember what it was like before we were saved, think about what it's like now that we're saved and think about what's going to be in the future. Now, Jesus was doing some teaching, and you can read this in Mark 10. We won't turn there, but Mark chapter 10, uh, all of a sudden a young man runs up. He's called the rich young ruler. He's rich, he's young, he's got it all together, and he's a ruler. He can't get any better than this. Remember, he ran up to Jesus, What must I do to gain eternal life? What must I do? Jesus gave him a whole list of things to do. And you know what that young man said? Well, I've already done all this. What do I still lack? So no matter how powerful he was, you rich young ruler, and he's done all these things, he still lacks and he knows it. So Jesus looked at him. You can read it in Mark 10 and it says he loved him. He's going to tell him the truth. He's going to bring him to the end of himself. <clears throat> he said, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And the young rich ruler just burst out and crying and left. He couldn't do it. And really what Jesus wants him to do is says, I can't do it. Just save me. And that's what he wants all people to do. Get rid of the riches of self and bow to the Lord. So everybody's standing around and wondering what just happened. This is what Jesus said in that situation. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You know, the eye of a needle is pretty small. You, it's impossible. You can't get a camel through the eye of a needle. And he's not speaking about money. He's speaking about personal wealth. You're uh, saying, I'm so powerful and so wealthy in myself that I can earn my way to heaven. It can't be done. And what's this whole world is, and we all have it, and this world is sick of it and has the sickness, self-richness. I'm so powerful, I can make it on my own to heaven. It's not going to happen. 
So everybody's standing around. What do you mean a camel through the eye of a needle? They didn't understand. So he brought the people around to the end of their logic. And they, they, say, they said, well, then who can be saved? They just realized it, it was impossible. So Jesus got them right where he wanted them. And here's what he said. He looks at them, Mark chapter 10, verse 27. With man, it's impossible. So already it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I always mention the fact that Blindside, I really like that movie and everything, but when they showed the picture on the, entering the college, it said, with, with men, this is possible. But with God, all, you know, it was a misquote and they did it on purpose because this world has a trouble with that truth. With, with man, it's impossible. We can't save ourselves, but with God, it is possible. So what this one man lacked was the willingness to just bow to Jesus. That's why the Sermon on the Mount begins with, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Willing to bow. Then you have the kingdom of God. So it's not anything we can earn. You must be born into it. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. We're born in Adam dead. We must be born again a second time. Then it's an inheritance. He explains it in so many ways. Just a few examples from the book of John. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him have, will have, will possess right now eternal life. Here's another one in John 5.24. Whoever believes has, right now, has eternal life. He will not be condemned, but he's crossed over from death to life. It's a current thing that's going on right now. It's, it's now. Here's another one in John 6 verse 40. The Father will, my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have, possess eternal life. And then on the last day I will raise Him up. This is what we all possess. And Jesus was telling the truth. He is the God of truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, He said. So they went to his tomb to see what went on. And three days later, his tomb's empty because he's conquered life. He's conquered death. He owns it all. He's not here. He's risen, the angel said. Some things are impossible for God. One of the things impossible for God is he cannot lie. God cannot lie. I know if you study Islam, God can lie because that's what they'd like to do. He's all powerful. And if he wants to lie, he can. No, God cannot lie. Another thing, God cannot die. In fact, Peter would say this in Acts chapter 2, verse 24. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. There was no sin in him, and he rose from the grave. So now we have a miraculous impossibility in verse 17 given to us. Now, if we are God's children. In other words, it's past tense. We're already God's children. So if we are God's children... We've accepted the gospel. We've said yes. Then look what happens. Then, so it's the if and then, we are heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ. No child of God is going to inherit death. It would be impossible. So we have eternal life and it starts right now. We're living it now. The second thing, we'll have then God's freedom. We'll be his children set free. Now, in, in Egypt, their children of God were in bondage in Egypt. Egypt it's very famous. And God looked down from heaven and he said, let my people go. Of course, Pharaoh's the boss. He's not going to do it. And so God protected his people in Egypt. And then he provided a way out. And it was through the substitute sacrifice of the lamb, the Passover lamb. And God even said this, listen, you change your calendar now. Make this the new, new year. He put a whole new new year in. This is the new year for you. Then he said, after seven years, after seven years, then the, the whole land is supposed to have a, a year of rest. And that rest means you have been set free. There's nothing to work for. And that's what the Sabbath rest is symbolic of, is the freedom we have in Christ. The Passover has been paid. Then he said this, after seven sevens of years, 49 years, on the 50th year, Proclaim liberty throughout the land. All debts canceled. Everyone returns to the original land and, and, and proclaim liberty throughout the land. And our, world le our government leaders even put that on the liberty bell. <clears throat> proclaim liberty throughout the land. God wants us set free in Christ. 
In fact, that's called the year of Jubilee every 50 years. Of course, I don't think they ever followed that. It's too hard to let the land rest for a year. And they didn't follow. And that's one of the reasons they lost the land. Because they kind of messed up the prophetic prefiguration of Christ. So really, if you think about it, a very thin line can make all the difference. I remember seeing a documentary on the Berlin Wall. If you remember the Berlin Wall after World War II and they separated East Germany from West Germany and it started out just as a little line on the ground. I remember seeing the documentary. People would walk up to it and it was illegal to go on the other side but if no one was looking they'd just hop over. Then it became a little taller and pretty soon it was all for, about freedom. Can I get on the other side of that line and get freedom? Eventually that, that wall became huge concrete wall. No one's going to get through that and freedom was guarded by a severe authority. It's kind of like that with Egypt. Egypt was guarding the freedom with their authority and trying to keep the people captive. They had no idea that a thin line on the door frames of the houses were going to make the people free, set them free. It's not the thickness that mattered. It's the reason and the power behind it. God was behind it. So failing to trust in God's plan of provision, you would not get set free. You had to put the door on the door frames of the house. And all in there were set free. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. I often think about that in the when I'm standing at the grocery line. There's somebody right in front of me. I think we're allowed to stand next to each other today. But I'm standing next to somebody and I think, boy, I have that thin line over me and I belong to the Lord. How about that person? They're only a foot or two from me. They may have a whole different... Uh, future and life and that thin line of Jesus Christ makes all the difference. So we have, we'll have eternal life, we'll have freedom. We also have then a family. Sons and daughters of God. We've been adopted. It's a supernatural Father's Day every day for us. It's the greatest miracle on earth that we own. It's, God designed it. It's called the gospel. Luke, uh, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells a parable of the prodigal son. He wants it to tell a story about this truth. And the prodigal son, he walk, goes up to his father. Father, give me my inheritance right now. I want it all right now. So he gives it to him. Then he goes and, you know, he lives a wild life and squanders it all. And then has to feed pigs. And he's dying and suffering. But he finally comes to his senses and realizes if I just repent and return to my father I will be his slave and everything will be okay. Maybe I'll be his slave. And so he starts to go back and he's going to go, okay, he practices. Father, forgive me. Father, forgive me. Then the father sees it from a long way off and runs after him and grabs him. And the father says, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, or put a robe around him, kill the fatted calf and let's celebrate. Because this son of mine was dead, now he's alive. The prodigal son thought he lost everything. He didn't realize how rich the father was. And it's just like that for us. We can always fail in our lives and maybe think we've lost that relationship with God. But what restores it is repentance, turning back, turning back. And we do it constantly. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. So just because we're God's children doesn't mean we're free to sin all we want. Now we have a father over us that cares about us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have an infinite family relationship that we can continually restore. We don't need a religion. We have a relationship. And we need to cultivate that relationship with the Father. Every day is Father's Day for us. So Jesus gave that parable of the prodigal son and, and the father in that parable restored the son, and, but there was an older son who, who didn't have a relationship and he was far off. He got upset that they're having a party for this son that did so many bad things. And then in that parable, the, the father explained, listen, this son of yours was dead, now he's alive. In other words, you, you can have this too, if you want. And then he said, we had to celebrate. Because now, and that's really what God wants to do. He wants to celebrate people that will Repent. So we can say, Abba, Father. Every day is Father's Day for us. It's in the gospel. I want to look at this little card. It's God's word. It's a beautiful way to just meditate on this all week. Maybe today. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. These are miracles. Look at this last miracle, verse 17. Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ. What a miracle that is. God, the perfect Father, has protected us in Christ and he's provided Christ for us and he will still do that for us. So we can celebrate Father's Day every day because we belong to him. In fact, God has set us apart so we are holy, holy, holy before God. Let's bow our heads in prayer as we give thanks for Father's Day. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you have made us holy before you. We aren't holy in ourselves, but we are holy because of the gospel, Lord. And that holiness is a gift. And now we can cry out, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. And that gift of holiness will spread to more and more in our lives. And we will, we will honor you and reflect your image the image of God in us more and more. And let that happen. In this Father's Day, let it spread across this land in our families, in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.